Funky, I'd like to welcome you to Thomas William Furniture Behind the Scenes Virtual Art Fair. I would like to introduce to you our host, Ned Wicker. Hello, Ned. Hi, Tom. Thanks for inviting me to be the guide on your virtual art fair. Today, we're going to travel out to Frisco, Colorado and see the world of Diane Hardy. Then it's off to Grafton, Wisconsin and painter Jeff Dallas. We'll go across Lake Michigan to Grand Rapids, Michigan and meet Steve Uren and his unique woodwork. And finally today, we're gonna to go out to Cuddy Valley, California and Barbara Bauman J, an interesting painter. So come on and join us. Welcome to Thomas William Furniture as we go behind the scenes of the shop in Stonebank, Wisconsin. We're about 30 miles west of Milwaukee. The shop is tucked in a pleasant and quiet subdivision. You would hardly think anything was going on. But inside, craftsman Tom Gumpke is busy creating a stunning line of furniture pieces which have been shown in art shows all over the country including the Smithsonian. Let's go inside and meet this award-winning artist. Hi, Tom. Thanks for letting us visit. Hi, Ned. It's nice to see you. It is very rare that we get to go behind the scenes and take a look at what you do. We see the end result, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, it's nice to see where it all begins. And we're kind of anxious to have a little tour. Sure. Yeah, um, seeing behind the scenes gives a person a whole different perspective uh, on the creative process. Seeing the end result is one thing, but to see how it's made, the time and effort put into it, really adds a different dimension. So, um, what, what are some of the machines that you have in your shop, and, and how do you select those? Okay, well here's a little video of my shop, which is located on my property, just 50 feet from my house. Um, very convenient and efficient shop. It's a 900 square foot outbuilding. It's very economical. Everything is well within reach. And as you step into my shop, you can see my little office there and a small selection of lumber which I try to keep a nice supply on hand. Never know what job is going to be coming up. And my machinery is of the Powermatic brand, which is a very durable, heavy duty equipment. And um, you can see that I have a wide variety of different machines, planers, table saws, chop saws, just very basic, nothing CNC, no computer equipment. Uh, just your run-of-the-mill machinery and uh, a lot of hand tools as well with planes and chisels, mallets and different types of hammers. Um, but that's just, that is the inside of my shop and you can see a little bit of the outside as well. Now is that a mortise machine that I see there? Yes, um, all my furniture is of traditional construction, mortise and tenon generate, uh, mortise and tenon uh, joinery and here I'm at my mortising machine and I'm cutting the mortises which receives the tenons. Uh, it's a very strong joint where you connect two pieces of wood at a 90 degree angle and after it's assembled the mortise and the tenon gets pegged and that gives it just a lot of extra durability and uh, my furniture is really created in a way that it can last for generations. Now, I, I see the, tr the the table saw, which uh, takes me back to high school and wood shop. But uh, uh, what, what are you doing with the uh, with the <laughs> table saw? Yeah, the table saw is an essential piece of equipment for a woodworker. Uh, it cuts and rips. And here you can see a little video of myself uh, on my finished planer. 
I have two planers. They're stacked one on top of the other. And the planer gives uh, the wood uh, consistent dimensions and a consistent finish. And here I'm planing some future table legs. Hmm. Now, uh, we, we, we see you uh, doing uh, working uh, with things, cutting pieces and everything. Uh, what are you? Uh, what would you like to show us in terms of some of the finished pieces? Well, as far as my finished pieces, I like to show you three of them. The first one is my signature piece called the foyer sideboard. Um, this is a really nice piece for an entryway. It's very attractive, and what's you really unique about my furniture? Everything is very slender light and airy so it works well for smaller living spaces uh, this foyer sideboard the top is a flame birch you can see the beautiful figure oh yeah the front is curly cherry and the door panels is the same flame birch and behind each door there's a small shelf that's adjustable and all mm. the drawers are dovetailed and I put aromatic cedar in the drawer bottom. So when you open the drawers, you get that nice cedar aroma. Oh, and wow. everything works very smoothly, all the dovetails. And um, I use traditional butt hinges. And you can see on the side here, the highly figured curly cherry. And what I really like about cherry is it darkens over age, over time as it ages and the figure just really pops. And another feature that I do is I finish the backs of my pieces nicely. So they could be standalones or room dividers. So they don't necessarily have to go up against the wall. Wow. It, it, the wood that you select, uh, I don't recall seeing that at Home Depot. No, I buy my, furniture, my wood from specialty lumber companies just north of me. And there is where I get all my exotics and the highly figured domestics. And then another piece I like to show you is my sofa table. This is a very, very popular piece. It's uh, 30 inches high, 50 long, and just 12 inches deep. And again, this piece is made of the same curly cherry, which is from the Pennsylvania area. And I accent this piece with wenge, the real dark wood. You can see it as a breadboard edge there on the ends. Wenge is from West Africa, very hard, dense wood. But it gives it a nice accenting feature. And again, the drawers are dovetailed with the cedar and the drawer bottoms. These pieces look very modern, but at the same time, they have sort of a traditional look about them. Was that intentional? Absolutely. I took the traditional shaker style, which is functional, utilitarian, very practical, and I gave it more of a modern feel with the contrasting woods and then sizing them more appropriately for people who are downsizing the condos or lofts or apartments. So keeping things, keeping my pieces slender is uh, a function that I'm known for in my work. Mm. Well, I can't wait to see more. And one more piece I'd like to show you, it's my tall display cabinet. And this one has two doors and two drawers. It's a nice piece for a customer who has a small collection of something, maybe pottery or blown glass. It's uh, very tall at 64 inches. But again, slender at 20 inches wide and just 12 inches deep. And again, you can see curly cherry, which is my favorite wood to work with. And it's accented with the dovetail keys, which are made of wenge. And inside the cabinet, I have it illuminated with LED lights. And I saw it on and off, which makes it very convenient and two adjustable glass shelves. Well, that's a stunning piece. And I would imagine that once somebody buys one of your pieces, they would be very tempted to buy some more. Well, I encourage people to do so because my furniture does create a nice grouping. 
I have 24 standard pieces on my website, and they all have a relative same feel to them. It's the modern shaker. And so it, it, it can, you know, two or three pieces in the same room just develops a nice grouping. Where do people get a hold of you and how, how can they uh, get a closer look at all these pieces? Absolutely. Uh, on my website, thomaswilliamfurniture.com, uh, you'll see all my pieces and every piece has five images of it. They have, you can see the front, the top, the back, the side, and um, all the descriptions as far as the wood types and sizes. And uh, I'm also on Pinterest and social media. So you can just Google Thomas William Furniture and I'll pop up somewhere. You know, it's been nice visiting, but I can imagine you miss going around the country and seeing all of your customers face to face at the art shows. Yes, the art fairs are a lot of fun to do. We meet some great people. Um, it's where I really get good ideas for future pieces to be developed. I just listen to the current needs of what people are looking for, and I try to incorporate those into my pieces and develop new pieces to keep it fresh. So when we go to the same show year after year, customers see new new product. Well, I imagine you want to get back in the shop, so we're going to let you go, Tom. Thanks so much uh, well, for visiting with us. Thank you, Ned. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, and we really have had a good time being behind the scenes, and we look forward to seeing you in an art show in the near future. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this visit, and we welcome you to join us as we look behind the scenes with other artists. Thank you for watching. You begin with strands of braid made of various fibers. You go to the antique chain stitch sewing machine, and that's fitted with attachments, and you make a hat. There are no pre-made forms or hat blocks, you and the machine. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, this is a very old technique, and it dates back to the 1800s. But that is the way Diane Hardy goes about her business creating an amazing collection of hats. Actually, they're more art pieces. She lives in Frisco, Colorado. It's right off of I-70. And if you're going by, don't drive too fast because you might go right past her. But today we get to look inside and meet this talented lady and see how braid becomes art. Hi, Diane. We're excited to see your artwork come to life and thank you for letting us in. Well, welcome to the studio. I'm here with all my hats. <laughs> with all and, your hats and in a beautiful setting. I love my little town. I wanted to show off some pictures of it because I think it's an amazing place to live. It's up at 9,000 feet in the mountains, but it's also pretty much a, a busy place because Breckenridge is nine miles down the road. So it's um, got five ski areas within about a 25 mile radius. So it's a Ooh. it's a happening place here and for its size. <laughs> I guess so. So how does one become a hat maker? Well, I have a degree in South Asian studies and botany from University of Wisconsin Madison. So I'm a Midwest girl, but I've been out west for a really long time, and I. Um, I started cutting up old clothes and making hats out of old fabrics and selling them in Missoula at the farmer's market. And then I discovered this antique straw machine technique. I um, saw hats made out of straw braid and I had to figure out how that was done. And I did some research. I had to, I flew to New York and got a sewing machine and it was before a lot of stuff was available on the internet. So I kind of practiced and practiced and figured it out and I fell in love with hat making again, all over again in a different technique. And um, in the picture now I'm sewing, I'm starting with a, a tight spiral on the top and building it. And I'm using my hands a lot to shape the hat as it's going and pulling and pushing from different angles to get the curves to happen. So it's, this is how they made hats 150 years ago. 
Yeah, my machine dates back to 1880, I think is when um, they started making them. And they used to sew them by hand before that with straw, plated straw braid. And um, it's, it's really fun to work with those little tiny machines. And I really have one that I use for almost everything, but I have backups just in case because <laughs> they're hard to find. So there's more than one machine that you use? Well, I use the straw machine that you see in the video for actually constructing the whole hat. And then I'll do some finishing on a home machine that you'll see in the other shots of my studio. I do use a regular home sewing machine to do some of the bands inside and the, some of the surface designs. And, um, and then I do a lot of hand stitching on some of the finishing too. Well, the hand stitching is what's really impressive. I mean, there's a lot of detail there. Yeah, that's more with the bands and the accents and the um, just a little extras. With the uh, with the hats, there there's so many different types of hats. Huh? I know it's the one that you have on now. I I'm really kind of liking that. But a lot of your stuff looks like a throwback to you know the 40s and the 30s and even and even earlier than that. Yeah, I love all the old um the old movies and the old styles and I just feel like they're so graceful and and elegance elegance to them that um we're missing in a lot of the fashions that, a lot of things that everyday fashions can be like that and so a lot of my hats are pretty simple as far as they're not really busy but I really take a look at the the profile and the outline and how they're how they're shaped and how they proportionally fit someone's head. Mm -hmm. it, it, do, do you make the same hat more than once, or is each hat a, its own separate creation? They're each, I feel like they're each a separate creation, and that is what makes it so much fun, and why I don't really get tired of it, is because each hat feels like its own piece, because a subtle difference in a hat can make it look a lot different on someone's head. So it's, I'll do orders and duplicate something, but I always have to warn the clients that, that's not exactly the same as the picture. They can try to get it the same, but it's not going to be the same. I like your shop. Yeah, it's a tiny, long, skinny little shop, but it has great windows. And um, it's I'm showing it in my messy state that it is usually in because it's just too hard to clean everything up and have a place for everything. But no, it works, usually it works for me. A lot of times the creative process does look chaotic, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Have you stayed primarily with making hats or have you wandered into a different direction? You know, I've, I've thought about making bags and I've bought some of the, you know, the handles or cl clasps for bags, but I've never really gotten to it because I've just not run out of ideas and color combinations and... I just still really enjoy making the hats themselves. Well, whether it be a bag or a hat, it, I, I'm kind of curious. What What do you want to achieve when you're making your pieces? Uh, well, I'll just show you. This is a stretcher that I have in my studio right now that's stretching a hat. I can spin it up and, and heat it up, and it'll make the hat a little bit bigger. So I can have some, a way to adjust sizes sometimes. But, um. What was that again? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what are you trying to achieve? I mean, when when you start a, making a hat, does it take on a life of its own? Yeah, I'm trying to achieve something that just feels like it looks beautiful. And it just wants, I want it to be something that, that just looks attract, like it has a, a style to it, but it's, it's not going to overwhelm someone. So I want someone to enjoy wearing the hat and not feeling like the hat is wearing them. Kind of. You know, looking at the, uh, at your collection, I can see the botany background, you know, the flowers yeah. and, <laughs> and really kind of organic type of design there. Yeah. I, do you draw on that a lot? Well, I really love textiles and the natural fibers. A lot of most, a lot of them are natural fibers and they feel really good. Like 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 plants in a way, <laughs> because this straw is is fun to work with, and the way it bends and curves and and the suppleness to it. 
you know, where do you see yourself going in, in the next few years, you know, as, as, as things evolve in the shop? Well, I'm trying to, you know, I'm really excited to actually not travel quite as much, although I really miss doing the shows right now. Um, I see that I can do an online, I have an online web store that I just set up a couple months ago and it's been going really well and I've been trying to I have a whole 120 hats on there right now so I've been trying to learn how to get a workflow going with the website and it's been fun because I can see what people really are interested in and I've been getting custom orders off stuff that's sold already so it's been just a, a learning experience for me and it's and I love people coming into my studio so I've had a couple people come up from Denver for appointments because that's about an hour away. And um, that's been kind of fun to show people the studio. And they come up and go out for lunch and have a day of it in the mountains. Has it been hard for you not being on the road and not seeing your customers? Yeah, because I always feel like I, they're my babies and I get to see them go off on to their new homes. <laughs> And I kind of miss seeing the people on them. And sometimes someone will send a picture and I, I like to see the pictures when they get them. Um, but I do miss interacting with customers directly and trying to help them find the right hat. Now to get a better look at your entire collection and uh, what, what's the best way to get a hold of you and where can people go to, to see this, uh, this collection, which is uh, actually very impressive. I've had a good time. <laughs> It's um the easiest thing is just directly to the website because I don't do I have I have a little bit on Instagram and Facebook and I and I try to keep up with that but the website is really the place is dianehardy.com Okay uh, well I appreciate you taking the time to to visit with us and to show us around it it's just been a joy to see you And we want to thank you for joining us and we welcome you to see another installment of the Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair, Behind the Scenes. We're taking a ride through a residential area in Grafton, Wisconsin. It's a few miles north of Milwaukee, right off of I-43. This nice yellow house you're looking at fits right in, but it's different. Inside is where artist Jeff Dallas has his studio, where his paintings take life. We'll get a behind the scenes look at this impressive collection. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Ned. Thanks for letting us in. Uh, we are always glad to get behind the scenes to see what goes on before the art show. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be with you today. Well, welcome, welcome, come on in. Yeah, uh, painters fascinate me. Uh, my wife, Debbie, loves the painter Van Gogh, the great uh, painter. Uh, but we always talk about where does this come from? And I, I guess the first thing I wanna ask you is, is what inspires you to paint? You know, Ned, I think for me, it really comes from growing up um, in a small town, being uh, close to nature. Um, this is back in the 70s when um, kids were kind of free to roam around a little bit more. And um, I also had a father who's uh, very into hunting and fishing. So I got to spend a lot of time in the outdoors. And I think Often when my dad was more into the fishing and hunting part of it, I was more into the beauty of the scenery and just really appreciating um, how powerful and like moving nature can be in its different moods. So I guess I always felt like I wanted to capture that feeling and really communicate it um, to other people in, in a really um, personal way and share that experience with someone else. Well, that intrigues me because while some painters might be very realistic in their, in their interpretation of, of, of nature, 
uh, your paintings seem to evoke a kind of emotion. So it's a feeling more than an exact representation. Yeah, I would, I would say you're definitely right. And I guess that's really what I want to communicate is um, that deep connection that we all have to nature at some level and um, share it with people. So how long does this take for you to do? What's, what's the process that you go through in creating one of your pieces? Um, so it typically starts off um, with a hike. Now, maybe I've heard about a beautiful place from someone else or I've seen a picture of it. Um, but typically, you know, I'll uh, pack my paints up in my backpack with my um, portable easel and a canvas and um, I'll hike out to a beautiful place. And um, I really, while I'm hiking out, I'm checking out all the different beautiful beautiful views of a place that I could make a painting from. And even though I'm typically headed out to make the most spectacular, dramatic view of a place, that's sort of the most iconic view. Uh, along the way on that hike, I often see four or five beautiful views that I could paint. And um, initially this sort of was difficult for me because I felt like there was no way I was going to be able to paint all these places. But um, in the, probably the last five or 10 years, I've been working with a technique that's more like a cubist technique, um, where I incorporate the different views of a place into one image to try to capture the whole of a place. I know that a, a lot of times an artist might work off of a... Uh a photograph, but I see that uh, you go out and you're, and you're sketching what you want to paint. That's right, Ned. Um, typically, I go out and as I hike, I do take reference photos to use later in the studio. I want the first experience of the painting to be um, on site. Um, to be able to really capture the essential nature and my first reaction. I mean, really, probably even more importantly, that first reaction is what I want to really capture and convey to other people. Because I mean, when you first walk out to a beautiful view, um, that feeling is really special and amazing. And, you know, after you're there for a while, that feeling kind of subsides, but the initial rush of that feeling is what I'm after. The paints that you select, was this a process that evolved over the years? You know, tell us, tell us a little bit about, about that and the kind of paints that you use. Okay. Um, typically, I use acrylic paint. And I like acrylic because it dries pretty fast, like in about 20 minutes. And I can do multiple thin layers. Um, you know, I, I only have to wait 20 minutes for a layer to dry. Whereas with oil, you have to wait, you know, like it. Uh, also, it's great in the field because when you paint something and you hike back through the brush, it's not going to smear off because it's already going to have, it's, it's already been dried, essentially. Um, and um, so as far as the colors I go, I use, the, the palette, I try to use a limited number of colors and I try to mix these colors as much as I can as I go and not use colors straight out of the tube so that I'm ensuring I'm really um, using colors that for the most part I've perceived uh, myself. Has that evolved over the years or has your style remained fairly constant? My style has actually changed um, quite a bit. And initially, my style was a little more like Van Gogh. It was kind of expressionistic and um, a little bit more literal as far as the space in the painting goes. Mm -hmm. I've been using um, cubist ideals where I combine different viewpoints in, into one painting. And that's been very interesting for me. Um, 
and at each painting becomes kind of a puzzle in a way because the, the angles and the viewpoints are different. And when I combine them together, I have um, lots of choices I can make that are purely artistic that I wouldn't necessarily have in a painting that I was just portraying from one point of view. What always fascinates me about artists is the is the techniques and 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 brush strokes and uh, how much paint and everything and and uh, every, everybody's different. Right. Yeah. It's um it's interesting how some artists are really into like heavy texture and thick paint on their paintings. And I occasionally use that in some places to emphasize something. Um, but typically, uh, my surfaces are relatively flat. But I do like to try to um, show the emotion, the feeling I'm having about a place through the, through the brush strokes itself. Um, so it's, you know... And to that point, it's it's always kind of a balance between trying to convey as a particular thing, like this rock has a particular shape. Um, and if I use strokes that are a little too controlled, it, it uh, tends to have kind of a flat feeling, if not look. And when I approach that same rock with a looser hand and a more emotional feeling as I do it, um, I think it comes across in the brush stroke, mm. but of course, um, it's a little bit, the, the balance between the controlled and the, the loose is, is a lot, is really the fun of it. I, I like the large canvas. Yeah, it uh, definitely gives you an opportunity to loosen up your arm and actually loosen up your paint strokes because, you know, of course, when you're working on a smaller canvas, um, you tend to make smaller uh, movements that you're pretty much doing with your hand. And when you're working on a larger canvas, you can get your whole arm and even your, your shoulders and body into the movement. And uh, I think it comes across to the viewer and they feel it and they, and they can almost feel something in their body maybe when they when they see that here we are inside not going to art shows because of the pandemic and i'd like you to address that a little bit and, and your interaction with the people who appreciate and purchase your artwork well it's certainly been a big shift for us um in dallas my wife and myself um we make uh, almost all of our income from art fairs. So that means we're on the road, you know, um, a pretty good amount of the time, probably like about a quarter of the time. And so now uh, for the last couple of months, we've been really home. And in a way that's been great because it just gives you a chance to ground down more into where into your life and even into the live um it's been good because i've had more time to paint in a way um but financially of course it's it's been a little bit dicey i've been fortunate in that i've sold a number of paintings since the pandemic has started so that's been um terrific really uh, people have been very supportive well we certainly do look forward to seeing you on the art show circuit uh uh you know, you've been all over the country and, and you've got fans everywhere. So, uh, but it's nice to have a few minutes with you at home, taking some time. And we appreciate the behind the scenes look, Jeff. Thank you so much, Ned. It's been uh, great talking to you. And we thank you for watching. Join us again for another Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair Behind the Scenes. We're outside a rather nondescript building in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Could be an auto repair shop or maybe a warehouse, but it's not. 
It's the studio of artist Steve Uren. Inside this gray box is where Steve's quality furniture with its striking details and functional design come to life. Home accent clocks and shelves that are also individual art pieces. Even a symbol cutting board becomes an art fair showpiece. Let's go inside and meet Steve and take a look around. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I am doing well. Uh, man, you run the gambit with, you know, cutting boards and beds and tables and all kinds of things. Tell us a little bit about the product line. Well, I make, uh, I make a lot of things. I make a lot of furniture, wood sculpture, clocks, like you mentioned, cutting boards. Um, you know, I make big, huge commission pieces to small, little, tiny clocks. Um, I, I do it because I love it. And so I get just as much satisfaction out of making the smallest little thing as I do the largest thing. How'd you get started? Uh, well, I, I've always had creative tendencies ever since I was little. And my grandfather was a woodworker as a, hobby, a hobbyist. And he built a cabin in uh, Upper Michigan way before I was born. And he built it from the ground up. He, he, he salvaged even old nails from barns to help put, put it together. And he just got pieces cool. together. And then he built all the furniture for it. And then, as you, then once he retired, he, he did a lot of carving. And he, he, he was just a really, really good woodworker. And I always admired it. So when I kind of decided I wanted to follow some kind of creative path, uh, woodworking was just the natural place to go. Now, furniture is one thing. Art is entirely different. What I'm captivated by is your selection of material to make these wonderful creations out of. Yes. Um, well, I use, I use only uh, domestic hardwoods, uh, mostly from the, the Midwest and Michigan, uh, precisely. Most of the hardwoods that I get, um, like the, the figured hardwoods, I should say, like curly maple, bird's eye maple, flame birch, all come from Upper Michigan. Um, and you can see I, I, I sort through uh, a lot of my material, like you can see me doing here, um, looking for the perfect piece for the idea that I have. Um, now, then I, now how, uh, how, how, do you, how do you select the wood? I, I mean, you, are you pretty fussy about exactly what kind of material you want to work with? I... Yeah, I am. I mean, I, I, I get I get the idea of, of what I'm going to make, and then I go and go through my lumber piles. I've got lots and lots of lumber, um, and I should say I don't I don't go out and purchase lumber for a project. I buy a lot of lumber, and then I then I'm able to go through it looking for the right piece for that that particular project. How much uh, lumber would you have on stock at any given time? I usually have about two thousand board feet on hand. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of, and, a lot of tables and chairs, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And I, I try not to make any scrap. Um, and you can see here I'm making my own veneer um, out of some tiger maple. Ooh, Just very, very nice. Then, yeah. And this is actually going to be a uh, custom entertainment center for some folks in Florida. Oh wow! So you you do you have standard items and then custom items as well? Yes, I do. So I, I do the art fairs, and I I meet people who who like my uh, aesthetics, my designs, and they want something maybe uh, specific based on my designs. Um, so they may see a table that I have, and they like the design, but it's too big or too small. They might want to get a bigger one or a smaller one. And and when, when, you, when you're cutting pieces and, and, and assembling your project, I mean, how, how do you fasten that together? Do, do you use nails or do you use other materials? Or uh, It's mostly glue and, and uh, tenons and some joiner, just different, different woodworking joinery. Um, I, don't, I don't use any nails. Um, occasionally, I, I'll use some wood, wood screws. I see here that you're, you're, you're gluing two pieces together and you're, and you're going to clamp them. Is yes. that for one of your cutting boards or a tabletop? That, that's or? actually going to be a tabletop for um, uh, a small little plant stand style table that I make called my August table. 
and it's about 12 inches by 12 inches square and uh, it's, it's it's one of my one of my uh, better selling designs so this will eventually be a, a, a small tabletop oh wow it's, it's it's kind of interesting to see uh, the table in in progress and yeah and and it's not often that we get to go inside the shop either and no. actually watch you work no I, I do work alone so not and I'm, I'm rarely being watched <laughs> you're really being watched okay yeah well I see uh, on the video that you're you're clamping that together and how long does that take to uh, to set up and and dry before you can work with it again uh, usually I clamp it, leave it in the clamps for about a half an hour or 45 minutes. And oh, that quick. I can, I can start um, working with it then, but it doesn't fully cure for about 24 hours. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Now, once you're you're done, the, the pieces have all been crafted, and then you have to put some kind of a finish on it. And uh, what, is your, what is your preference there? Um, I, I spray a... a a moisture resistant lacquer um, it, in, a, in a spray booth, obviously. And here you, you see me um, spraying some uh, table legs, actually. That's going to be a, a small uh, credenza or the, um, the uh, cabinet style table cabinet. Now, when with the spray lacquer, is there any color with that or is that a clear lacquer? It's a clear coat, um, yeah, and it, it has a, a UV protectant in it which is oh. really, really nice. It, it keeps uh, a lot of the lighter woods from turning darker and a lot of the darker woods from turning lighter. So I, um, I, I you know, I don't stain or dye any of my, any of my work. So um, keeping the natural colors of the wood is pretty important to me. Well, that was sort of my next question. You know, it's just the natural beauty of the wood itself that's coming through. Yes, yes. I imagine that is, is part of... Um, of the attraction to your pieces because it's uh, it, it's one thing to to stain and lacquer. It's quite another thing to really bring out the natural beauty of the uh, of the material itself. Right, and it's 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 just so cool to actually stand there and spray something with some wood with some really high figure. The it just it just pop, the figuring just pops out of like a, you know, a high figured tiger maple or something. It's, you know, it's instant gratification. It just, just explodes with character. Now, how many coats is that, Steve? Uh, do you, do you sand and then spray again? Yeah, I, I do three coats. So I, I'll let it dry. And then once it's dry, I'll, I'll sand it lightly and then I'll, uh, you know, dust it off and then I'll spray it again. Now, once you get all of these uh, pieces, then the, then you just kind of go into the final assembly and and yeah, uh, I do. I, I I assemble it all. And um, one of the things I like to do when I finish a piece um, like this, this is a, a custom uh, table for some for some great customers. Um, I like to uh, put it together like I'm doing here, and then stand back and look at it for the and just take it all in. Um, that's one of my rituals, I guess. I, ha I have to ask you this. Do you ever look at something and say, I don't like it and I won't ship it? Nah, <laughs> not, not that I've made as a commission. I have made, I have made pieces that, I, that I'm not real thrilled about and I don't show them. Um, sometimes they end up in my home. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's just yeah. like a chef eating his mistakes. Right, right, right. <laughs> Right. Well, that, that, that is interesting. And, and obviously, if you take on a piece of uh, custom design, it's to the specifications of your of your customer, is it not? Yeah, yeah. That, you know, and I, they always get a, a, a drawn out design. I, I hand since everything's handmade, I actually write it out on a pencil and I send them a design and with complementing mm -hmm. pictures of other things I've done and different designs. And um, so they, they already know what they're going to get. Um, I, I make sure that they, they understand it as much as I do. Now, one of the things I was going to ask you about is, uh, you know, with the pandemic going on and everything, how have things changed for you? You're obviously not being able to get out to art shows all over the country. No, it hasn't. So I, I've been doing um, more, more work on online um, through my website um, and doing, you know, promoting some more co custom work. Um, 
Um, right there's a um, some flame birch right there um, in the in two nightstands. This is part of a bedroom set commission that I'm doing. Um, and you know, I, I I really miss the art shows. I miss talking with my customers and meeting new people, and you know, traveling to some pretty amazing places. Any any place in particular that's your favorite? Um, you know, Madison, Wisconsin is one of my favorite places. Um, I really enjoy the people and the towns there. I don't, I can't say that I dislike anywhere I've ever been, um, but I certainly have some um, better markets. I could say like Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago is a very very fun place for me to sell uh, my work. Um, Kansas. Kansas. Uh, or Kansas City, sorry, uh, Missouri. Okay. Now you've been you've been at this a long time, Steve, and so many pieces and so many creations. Where do you get your ideas and what inspires you? You know, I um I've been doing this for twenty years and I, I still have more ideas than time. Uh, to make them happen. So, um, I, you know, my ideas just, I just literally get ideas in my head. Um, I, I kind of think of something that would, it just pops into my head and, and I uh, kind of think about the size and then I go through my lumber piles and uh, find the right piece for that top or the, you know, if the focal point's going to be like a, uh, you know, a cabinet door front, then I'll start looking for perfect woods for that and for, for the idea and I, uh, I make it. Well, this has been a delight visiting with you, and I know you want to get back in the shop and get after your craft, yeah. but I, I appreciate you taking the time and visiting with us. Oh, I appreciate uh, you guys as well. Well, Steve, we'll let you go. Thanks, brother. Now, right, there's a you. lot more to see and many more artists to meet, so let's join again for the Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Gallery Behind the Scenes. We're gazing at a strikingly beautiful piece of property in Cuddy Valley, located in the Los Padres National Forest and in the San Emigneo Mountains of Southern California, about 80 miles north of Los Angeles. The elevation is 5,400 feet. The adjacent mountain is nearly 9,000. The summit is the highest point in Ventura County, Mount Pinos, and it's covered in pine trees. This is the studio of Barbara Bowman J. And we've been invited to take a tour. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for letting us in. Hey, Ned. Uh, thank you for that good introduction to Muse Ranch. Uh, when we checked out this property in 2004, we immediately were drawn to the remoteness, the vast amount of open space surrounding the pastures and across the valley. The outbuildings on the property were perfect for setting up a studio. And of course, there was the quietness and the beauty of the land. So we purchased the place. Um, after being here a few weeks, we knew we had a unique and inspirational place to be. We liked the idea of a force or a muse that could inspire us and preside over the arts that we were creating. So, and we also wanted to name our place. So what could be better than Muse Ranch? I see that you're in your studio today, 1,300 square feet, pretty big place. And maybe you could take us around and give us a look. Well, thank you. I would love to show you around. This is the interior of my studio. It's showing the shelving that I have from Home Depot. Uh, it's also showing you the work areas that I have, whether it be for framing or painting. I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of shelves so I can hide things away. And it also houses my press, which is a Tackage press with a 40 by 72 inch bed. It has uh, space for my brayers and my inks and my rollers and the chemicals that I need to use to create the monotypes, which is a one-of-a-kind print with no additions or multiples. And I have many table surfaces that I can dry my pieces on and work on them directly. 
I also am very fortunate to have a vertical file system and I have a phot photography setup station so that I can um, document all my work before it is uh, given to galleries or sold at art shows. The storage uh, for my encaustics is right below my window. And then I have a system of old graphic display stands that I hang work that is used for drying. I can inspect the work. I can see if my work's in progress. And I can also see how pieces relate to each other. When you set up your studio originally, 1,300 square feet, uh, did you ever come to the point where you thought, maybe I want some more room? Uh, yes, <laughs> you can. You, there's always need for more room, but more room means more, uh, more things to handle. So, um, thank you. Did you have another question you wanted to ask me? Well, I was just uh, wondering how long it took you to design the, the studio to get everything really the way you wanted it. Oh, well, that's happened. We've been here uh, 15 years. And so that is, is, it's a slowly evolving thing, just like my studio is. Well, let's, let's take a look at some of your completed work and describe some of your techniques for us. Certainly. Uh, you're, right now you're looking at two <laughs> monotypes. Uh, there is no addition to a monotype. It's a full bleed. You can see that I use a limited color palette, and uh, this gives the pieces the ability to hang together and support each other, although each piece stands alone. Also, all my works are non-representational. This particular piece that you're looking at is very soft. It's understated in its content. It is not very contrasty. Whereas this piece is stronger and more contrasty than the previous pieces, they are monotypes, but they're mounted to panels. Whereas a piece like this is a more traditional approach to the monotype with a margin and the signature is on the art front. Over the years, how has your style developed? How, how have you changed? Well, um, I have always been working in a, uh, a seco process, which is what the piece the red piece that you're looking at right now is. It is uh, overall, it's a subtle implied texture. There's no specific focus to the piece. Uh, you start looking in the smaller areas, whereas a piece like this, the composition is broken up into rectangular shapes and it's a very highly a textured piece. This piece incorporates silver leaf and it makes a nice complement to the dark and white and the gray. When you look at a piece, uh, another Osseco piece, you are seeing um, strong vertical stripes that help to carry you through the piece. And then of course, this is a grouping that someone can purchase as a single piece or as an entire grouping to make a larger statement. Oh, the wow. squares in my pieces really represent my years from living in West Africa, where I seem to be intrigued by the mystery of all of the open spaces in all of the compounds. And so when you look at these spaces, you feel that there's something that you're not understanding or you're, it's not visible. So there's an element of mystique to those pieces. Watching an artist work has always fascinated me. Can you show us how you begin and even finish a piece of your work? Absolutely. So right here, I am prepping a panel for a painting. I pour plaster on a painting. Then when it sets up, I sand it outside and do the finishing sanding inside in order to make the surface completely smooth and absorbing. Um, I sand it, I wipe it, and then I take dry pigment, mix it with water, so it's water-based solution, and I apply that to the panel so that 
the, there's a basis for the future of the oil painting. So I start with just pigments and then I move into oil painting. And after the oil painting is evolving, then I start to add um, cold wax to the oil paint. So right now I'm simply um, applying my base layer and I usually work on several pieces simultaneously. I like to uh, allow a dialogue to develop among my pieces where I can explore both content and experimental and deliberate actions. My content is never representational. It's always a response to the subconscious and the conscious movements. Uh, I act upon impulse and intuition and together they give me an awareness of keeping things in a stylistic, um, cohes cohesive feeling. The piece I'm working on right now is a, it's an almost finished piece. And of course, I'm working with small brushes right now. However, the paint is applied with large brushes and uh, spatulas and different tools. But the question I find is, when is a piece done? And I have to give enough information to the viewer, but not to overwork a piece. So even though there's mostly large areas are complete, I take a razor blade and I do some minor adjusting, removing some of the wax with a with razor. But because I don't fix a piece after it's done, uh, the monotype allows me to inform my paintings and the paintings inform my monotypes in terms of a stylistic um, presentation. When someone looks at your work what do you hope the viewer sees in that finished piece and where can someone go to see more of your work okay so basically when someone is approaching my work uh, i want them to respond to what it is that they are seeing whether it be the texture or the composition I want to capture their interest and appreciation of order by using strong verticals and horizontals, as well as rectangular shapes. And there's a lot of unpredictable occurrences from the way the paint is applied. I'm also hoping to lead someone's mind to an awareness of the minimal narrative content, making the time and the place um, familiar, but really not very determinable. My pieces are not literal. They are not abstracted. They are what's called process driven, driven, meaning that they evolve from one action to another. They are contemplative, whether they're subtle, there's quiet colors or vibrant hues. I don't feel my pieces are busy or entertaining. But when someone is looking at my pieces, they shift the foc their focus from the structure and color to the subtleties of layering and texturing. And I like to think that they are more or less a balance of intellect and senses. So I have no real deep or elegant explanations for my work. It really just is. So if someone wanted to see my work, um, though my 2020 art festivals have been canceled or postponed, there is opportunity to view and purchase works through my website or my Instagram account, which is Barbara Bowman J. I also show on Instagram art show artists and soon to be my YouTube channel. I also have three galleries that car currently carry my work and they also are listed on my website. And just like me and many of the other artists, they too are feeling the results of social distancing and quarantining. So we all welcome interest and support from our patrons and the public. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to show us around and to show us your work and to show us the heart and the soul behind it. And this has been a lot of fun, Barbara. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. I welcome you to my studio. Come and see me sometime in real life. 
Oh, that is something I would love to do. It looks like a beautiful location. Thank and we you thank man. you for watching the Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair behind the scenes. And we invite you to see other artists on the tour. Take care and stay safe.